and welcome to Banking Transform, the top podcast in retail banking. I'm your host, Jim Roos, owner and CEO of the Digital Banking Report and co-publisher of the financial brand. With their unique preferences, behaviors, and technological fluency, Gen Z and younger consumers are reshaping the landscape of banking products, channels, and engagement strategies. With this in mind, how do banks connect with and build loyalty among the emerging Gen Z demographic? What technologies, products, and messaging matters? Join us as a true expert in the field, Brendan Coughlin, Vice Chairman and Head of Consumer Banking at Citizens. Brendan has extensive experience in navigating these dynamic shifts, providing invaluable insights into this very demanding segment of the population. So what is so different about Gen Z? Why is it so hard to meet their needs when there's such a massive segment? Every financial institution is asking that question. The challenge is, what do we do about it? So Brendan, you're a longtime banker coming up on, I think, 20 years at Citizen Bank. A lot has changed at Citizens and the banking industry as a whole over the last two decades. What are the biggest changes that you've witnessed and how has your bank tried to adjust? Yeah, well, thanks, Jim. And looking forward to the conversation here. I appreciate you having me on. Um, I believe this is a bit of a seminal moment for our industry uh, here. And every, you know, two or three decades, you get industry that, um, you know, navigates through such transformational dynamics that it sort of challenges the very core of why we exist and how you compete to win. And I believe that's what we're going through right now as a banking industry. And Gen Z is sort of leading the charge to push banks into different territory, uh, for sure. And you know, it's no secret that our industry has been going through a digital uh, revolution and COVID exacerbated those trends by a number of years to uh, really force the banking industry to make the easy things uh, truly easy. Uh, But to me, it's much more than when you think about digital banking, it's much more than uh, just self-serve and using your phone. It actually is challenging the very reason why a customer says that they want to bank with you in the first place. And, And let me unpack that for a quick second. So if you go back 15 years, customers used to pick banks Uh, And they would overwhelmingly answer why uh, based on convenience. And to them, convenience was defined as physical presence, branches and uh, ATMs. Now, when you ask customers why they choose a bank, uh, convenience is a part of it, but it is no longer the overwhelming majority. And convenience, by the way, is no longer exclusively defined by physical presence. It's defined by the effectiveness of your digital capabilities. Uh, and it has actually moved from being your differentiator to table stakes. And, uh, you know, by definition, if your definition of convenience is physical, you can only have one branch on a corner. So it's differentiated. When your definition of convenience is digitally led, it becomes uh, pretty ubiquitous. So the ways bank uh, banks now set up to compete with one another are on mechanisms that are bigger and different than convenience. It's on value creation and differentiation. And so this whole digital trend uh, led by Gen Z is unlocking the need for banks to think at their very core as a very different business where they're here to provide not just convenience and service, they're here to provide tremendous and different value than the bank next door. Uh, and so banks really need to pull up and evaluate how they're doing that. And, and you, you, it's no wonder why when you look backwards in our industry, there are 5,000 banks plus or minus in the United States. And I think truly it would be hard to say which banks are transformationally differentiated from one another. A lot of banks are very similar, and that's because they didn't have to be because they were competing on convenience. And so it's really pushing us as an industry to truly look ourselves in the mirror and say, what value am I going to now create that's truly, truly different? And you can describe that to a consumer, particularly Gen Z. And that's how they're looking at us. So, Brendan, you know, when you look at the Gen Z and and really just the younger consumer in general, what core needs and values define them? Yeah, well, look, first, I'd say Gen Z uh, uh, is is, uh, getting to fairly um, uh, heavy levels of scale. Uh, There's predicted that at least four million Gen Zers will 
open up accounts each year. So as banks think about how they serve this segment and what they're what they're asking for to your question, it's important to first acknowledge that this is a meaningful part of our um, our uh, you know citizens base in the United States now, and we really have to take this very very serious and lean in hard. Uh, I would say you know starting number one is uh, tried and true. Uh, you know Americans tend to. Uh, uh, describe themselves as not very financially confident or financially empowered, and they're anxious about their the state of their finances. And I'm going to pull this thread a little bit more on digitization trends and why it's impacting this so much. Uh, you know, 10, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, uh, people weren't all, all, all that close to their money. You'd go balance your checkbook on a Saturday, and then you hope that during the week, nothing kind of went off the rails. Uh, with digital, not only is it self-serving, but now you have all this data and insight and information that we as banks can deliver to our customers day in and day out to take that cognitive load away, make them feel closer to their money, make them feel more financially confident, make them feel more financially empowered, all at the palm of their hand. So digital to me is much more than self-service. It's about living your brand promise of making your customers feel um, more financially fit, help them get closer to their financials. So Gen Zers, number one, are demanding that. They're demanding more than just functionality in their bank. They're demanding advice. They're demanding help. Yeah. They, they give us tons of data and information. How do we then translate that back to them that makes them live their life uh, in a significantly uh, different way? Uh, you know, whether you're spending more money than you did last month, we should tell you about that. Whether your gym membership's coming up on a Friday and you don't have the funds to cover it, so we nudge them to make sure they avoid an overdraft. All of these things are real time and very helpful uh, to get customers financially fit. So that's going to ultimately be table stakes on what this Gen Z generation expects from their bank is more value day in and day out. Then how do you differentiate yourself further? It's going to be in the products, the services, and the value that you bring to them uh, in, over the course of their life. So other than just having a checking out, other than just having a mortgage, other than just having a student loan or a credit card, what is it that makes you truly different? Why do you exist as a bank? And how do you bring that to life for them in a different way. And so banks really need to answer that question in tangible ways uh, that you can't just logo switch and all the banks saying the same stuff. You know, that's a great point, because when you think about it, Gen Z is, is used to making decisions with the touch of a button and they pick solutions that way. All solutions, not just financial, but even outside the financial services industry. Well, as you look at more fintech startups, you look at a lot of competition in the marketplace, you know, Gen Z can make a decision to switch without you even knowing they've done so. So how do you gain the attention and trust of a generation that can, you know, basically they can call Venmo their primary bank if they wanted to? Yeah, I, I think that's a very uh, important trend to keep our eye on. And, um, you know, at the end of the day, if you pull back up to what Gen Z really wants, it's connectedness and financial confidence and empowerment in that seamless one-click way. And so what I think the fintechs have done an excellent job of is, uh, is really trying to disrupt different parts of the financial services ecosystem. So, you know, some go after the lending space and they're doing, whether it's personal loans or buy now, pay later. Some are going after uh, some parts of the deposit ecosystem and creating day-to-day -day banking uh, solutions. Uh, some are going after parts of the mortgage e ecosystem or to your point with Venmo, kind of peer-to-peer -peer payments. At the end of the day, uh, what none of those fintechs really can do is bring it all together for the client in a seamless way. And so the best defense is great offense in my mind. And so if you're a um, diversified financial institution and your mission in life is actually the sum of the parts, it's to bring together all of those pieces of your financial services wallet and create value that cuts across all of those point-to-point -point solutions that the fintechs are disrupting. That's where retentive behavior can really um, uh, uh, come to life in a, in a very significant way if you can do it well. And so, you know, we look at the fintechs that admire their speed, admire their ability to disrupt. And then I also pause and say, as a banker, why am I not bringing that to life for my customers day in and day out? The days of being complacent and just being able to win because you have the right branches and the right corners, those days are over. And so uh, in order to 
uh, continue to engage this generation and keep them with the bank, you have to constantly be on your front foot. You've got to be innovating. You've got to be challenging yourself every day. What did I bring to my customer base? What innovation have I created that made their life better from a financial management standpoint? And the, the second you don't have a good answer to that is the second they're going to actually get distracted and move some of their relationship to another spot. So it's creating a speed and pace of innovation in the banking landscape that I believe is is uh, really going to start to separate the winners from the losers in traditional banks. And and without question, there's going to be less than 5,000 banks in the U.S. if you fast forward five to seven years. And it is the ones that do this better that will be in the winner's circle and survive and get more scale, be able to invest more for their customer base. But you've got to have that innovation mindset. But personally, I believe that the banks, if they can do that, are significantly better positioned than the fintechs who tend to have point-to-point -point solutions and you can only disrupt and win in a sliver of their financial life versus being the sum of the parts and connecting those dots across for the client. Okay, so let's get down to the basics here. You know, Citizens Bank over the last several years, I've been watching them. We've had you on the show several times and you're continually transforming banking as it used to be. You've done a lot in the digital space. You've done a lot in the innovation space, but you've also done a lot in targeting the Gen Z customer. What are some examples of what you've done as Citizens Bank to target and engage Gen Z in the areas of things like products and branding and campaigns. Yeah, we've done we've done a tremendous amount, and thanks for the recognition of of how far we've come. We we went public, um, separating from the Royal Bank of Scotland back in two thousand and thirteen and fourteen, and we've been on a bit of a tear to really reposition this bank, and uh, we've had that innovation mindset. And you know, I'd, I'd point you to a couple of examples. Uh, number one. Uh, you know, back in 2012 and 13, which is quite a ways away at this point, but it still rings true as an innovation that we've created that helped us uh, acquire this segment. You know, we got into the student loan business while everybody else was running away from it, coming off the heels of the great financial crisis and um, uh, the government taking over uh, a lot of the student loan market. And then we were first to market in the U.S. providing a student loan refinance opportunity. We sort of took a look at it and said, geez, well, you can restructure every other part of debt in, in, in America. But, you know, the way the federal student loan program was situated, uh, it didn't reward folks for getting a good job, getting out of school, uh, landing on their feet, and then restructuring to better interest rates. So we said, well, that doesn't make any sense. Let's do that. And so we've made it a mission to find these opportunities for tangible value creation for this segment. And we've ac acquired um, you know, hundreds of thousands of customers through that program, helped us grow our business, but certainly uh, not a lot of banks are in that space. So it's become a very distinctive tool for us to go out and acquire uh, a newly graduated Gen Zer to come into the firm in ways that we offer distinctive value that the bank next door does not. Um, we then innovated in the buy now, pay later space, which is you know a little bit of a, of a toxic word these days in our industry. Uh, and but we did it the right way. We've sort of been moderate and measured on our growth. But uh, we went in and said, hey, look, you know, Gen Zers and at the time uh, the the um, uh, lower aged uh, millennials were really uh, uh, a little distrusting of the card industry. And they were looking at it saying, geez, I can afford a monthly payment, but I'm not sure I can actually afford the full debt as it accumulates. And so at some point, this product is structured for me in such a way that um, it's allowing me to get over leveraged. And that's where the buy now, pay later space popped up is, you know, modernized layaway, modernized installments. I know what the payment's going to be. And so we were first mover there. We innovated in that in 2015. Uh, we um, signed a relationship with Apple. At one point, we were financing uh, upwards of 50% of iPhones across the entire country uh, that were purchased and created what I think is one of the best. Wow. Wow. Um, uh, financial services experiences in our industry. And the insight there was really digging into the millennials and the Gen Zers and saying, what do they really want and need from a financial services institution? And it was a combination of brilliant digital experience ma married with great value creation around the product and the terms that we offered. And we created real explosive growth there and had since grown that business to you know, firms like Microsoft and BJ's and now Peloton, we announced um, a handful of weeks ago. So we've really leaned into a modernized payment ecosystem. I'd say the other thing, aside from products and services, is how you market to these customers. Uh, they uh, very much uh, are uh, looking at brands to see what you stand for, see how you live and breathe in the communities that you operate in. And they're interacting with brands in different ways. So we've totally modernized our marketing packages from just 
you know, standard television advertising to get the brand out to be being on forms like TikTok, uh, a lot of direct marketing, really trying to figure out how to find these customers where they are and allow them to. We, we're a sponsor of Live Nation, um, the uh, uh, concert tour in Boston. Uh, there's lots of different things that we're doing to position the brand to be where this uh, community is. So the combination of that value creation through products and services and being forward leaning on how we think about customer acquisition and, and, and branding has really paid a lot of dividends and, and we're winning the ground game. We're growing this segment faster than most uh, most other banks as a result of all that. You know, it's interesting. You talk about the credit side of the business, which really is a real bond builder for the Gen Z consumer. But to do that and to do it deeply, you have to look at credit differently. You have to look at credit scores differently. You have to look at the value of the consumer differently. What did your organization do to change what I call the legacy mindset of, oh, we want only A credit or A B plus credit? I mean, obviously, when you're looking at financing phones, you have to look at credit differently. You have to look at the consumer differently. What did you do internally to really transform the legacy thinking around the value of the consumer? There's a lot of, and it's a great question, and there's an enormous amount of innovation that happened in the credit side to be able to think this way. And uh, what I would tell you is, um, you know, not not specific to Apple, by the way, don't really disclose any stats on them, but just our overall um, credit portfolio, right. as an example, on our citizens pay business, which is our buy now, pay later solution. Uh, you know, in some of our relationships, we've got over an 85% approval rate, but our credit losses are about a third of a credit card. And so, we have done a lot of innovative things to, you know, FICO scores through COVID were inflated by a lot. So you kind of look at it and say, well, I can't underwrite on FICO alone. And if you're a sleepy banker that's sitting around doing things the way you used to do 10, 20 years ago, uh, you're going to wind up with a lot of credit risk in your book right now that you didn't realize you had because of inflated FICO scores. So we go look at all the data we have available to them. We see what credit cards they're paying, their free cash flow. We're looking at their trended FICO scores. We're looking at income, disposable income. Are you somebody that's living on the edge of uh, your paycheck every week? Are you packing some away in savings? Those tend to be incredibly predictive. The things that you buy tend to be incredibly predictive of your credit worthiness. All of those things allow us to, in a traditional banker's speak, they'd say we could buy deeper in the credit spectrum uh, because you've found a lot of other data and information that give you confidence in that customer that maybe you didn't have if you just looked at their FICO score alone because they hadn't built up a credit history the way that traditional bankers would get comfortable with. And so we haven't taken any more credit risk than any other bank, quite the opposite. We've got a super prime portfolio of credit, but we've been able to approve a lot more people because of the innovation on just understanding what you have available to you with this customer segment and being smarter and not kind of being stuck uh, in the mud. I, I'd also say your question was on credit, but um, the connectedness across credit and deposits is important. A lot of that data comes from uh, the information that we have on their payments and spending through deposits. And so we've had to be innovative on the deposit product set to say, like the days of asterisk banking and gotchas around fees and otherwise it's over. It's over. You've got to simplify the platform, make it easy for them to bank with. So we rolled out Citizens Peace of Mind, which is our version of a 24-hour uh, grace period on overdraft. We have an engaged customer experience. We never want anybody to be surprised. Um, like 85% of our overdraft fees uh, going back to the, the financial crisis are now gone. Uh, handed, and that makes our platform really attractive to the younger demographic that tends to live, live more paycheck to paycheck until they get on their feet. And then we did things like get paid early. So on Wednesdays, you get paid instead of Fridays. Uh, for, for many customers, that's not um, tangibly a value for them. For the Gen Zers, it's a huge value. Um, and so we've really reconstructed our deposit book and our credit book. And it's the sum of those th two things that give us a lot of insight that make us confidently be able to approve more folks for credit than maybe some other banks that are looking at it in a traditional way. You know, it's interesting. I visited WeBank back in uh, the beginning of 2020. And it was interesting because they built their business a lot like you did. They said, you know, when we take the consumer base as a whole, and if we finance phones, and there's, there's, that was one of the areas they went after. And if we manage risk as opposed to avoided risk, we're able to go a lot deeper into the portfolio and get a lot more customers. As a result, 
The losses weren't that great, but the, the overall portfolio was so much larger that as a percentage, they did a lot better. And it seems to be really along the line of what you've done saying, you know what, we're going to look at risk differently, we're going to look at the consumer differently. We may not generate the, the $1,000 balances and deposits, but the consumer as a whole and our expansion of portfolio helps pay for that all together. So when you look at technology like AI, uh, predictive analytics, virtual assistants, how do they play a role in providing both relevant insights and experiences for the Gen Z consumer? Yeah, there's so many different uh, ways that you can uh, start to use emerging technologies to create better experiences for, uh, for this consumer. And in many ways, we're just starting to scratch the surface. Uh, on that. When you think about all the data that we have available, as an example, on credit underwriting, you know, most commonly you jump to use cases that are customer facing where you're providing value or insight to them. But some of this credit work that we've done is totally behind the scenes, but we've created machine learning and AI to really digest and, and analyze a lot of the information that we do have to inform our credit models that ultimately just result in a, an approval rate that's much higher uh, than we would have without that. So this this computing um, speed and pace that we uh, are now afforded has really helped us behind the scenes. Uh, in the front of the business, uh, we've done um, a lot of different things and we're starting to do more and more. So you think about uh, we, we, we relaunched a platform called Citizens Insights. And so now we're taking all of that data and information outside of a credit context, and we're providing real-time insights to the customer on their phone uh, all day long with all that data and analytics. And if they want to interact with us on it, they can click on it and chat with us through sort of an AI-powered chatbot. And if it gets to a place where we need a human, it just clicks into a human. And so it's the power of data and analytics then translated to something that's actionable. I'd say the other thing that maybe is not as talked about in the industry is um, the cost-based transformation through some of this stuff can be quite compelling. And so, you know, going back to our example of buy now, pay later and financing something that's $1,000, you know, banks didn't make a living um, doing that in a lot of ways because they were running their, their, their business model in a very traditional way from a lending standpoint. And the cost, the cost to do that was just too much to justify the revenue of doing small ticket financing. You insert machine learning and AI and digital forward experiences on the front end, you could take the cost almost entirely out. And now you got a whole business and you're serving a whole new segment because of this technology and innovation that was otherwise unreachable uh, before. And, and in, in many cases in our buy now, pay later business, we'll just swipe your debit card or credit card. It doesn't have to be a citizen's one at all. And that's the that's all you need to do to get underwritten with us. No paper, no signing, no uh, anything, no cost, no people reviewing it. We're just taking the information we get from your credit card swipe and you're done. And so and and behind all that is is to your point, you know, machine learning and AI models that are really helping us to, to sift this through to give us confidence to do that. But the cost dynamic there is important because if we couldn't take the cost out, then we wouldn't have a business model that would allow us to lend in those spots. And so there's a very uh, big connected ecosystem. And we're just getting we're just getting started, I think, as an industry on how uh, this can really help to modernize uh, modernize the the uh, the banking landscape. Um, which, by the way, the folks that are able to invest in this stuff more aggressively tend to be the bigger banks. And so you elevate all the way up, back up, big picture, and say there's 5,000 banks in the U.S. If these are important unlocks to the future of banking, to really put some differentiation and innovation, uh, you know, I, th I think the big banks have a materially competitive advantage to do this faster than than the smaller banks, uh, which which I think we're starting to see in the market share wars right now. Well, what's interesting too, and, and it goes beyond that, I think, I think it also goes into the leadership um, category. You know, your leadership has changed tremendously. You have gotten a lot of very digitally focused, tech focused leaders in your organization. And I think that really sets the stage for these transformations and to be able to reach new segments that demand this higher digitalization. But, you know, when we look at digitalization, it's not just about doing things faster and easier for Gen Z. They also want to balance some human con connection. How do you do that at Citizens? Yeah, you're 100 percent right. And, you know, you think about COVID, uh, the you know, the shock to the system, not just in financial services, but retailing overall, that you were forced to not interact with physical points of presence. Um, and, you know, it's been three decades. Our industry has been talking about the death of the branches and when is it going to come? And it's, it's going to come eventually. Well, 
if it's not going to come when you're forced to not go, and then you all you ultimately kind of go back and um, and and reengage with physical presence, I think that tells you something that the balance in our industry serving humans and digital in a connected way makes uh, a ton of sense. And the analogy I give folks all the time is, you know, when I was um, you know, before COVID, I never got groceries online ever. Um, and, you know, through COVID, I had to, and because everybody did, right? And so I got used to that. Uh, but now here we are in a post-COVID world, and I've got trained on the convenience of buying my basic groceries, my cereal, my milk, and my whatever. But if I'm having a party and I want to go have a bunch of people over and it's important to me that I want to get the right steak or the right fish, I'm going to the supermarket and I'm going to pick it out with my own eyes. That's what Gen Zers and the industry is working through on banking is that they want the simple stuff to be truly simple and digital, but they need to see the whites of um uh, the, the, their bankers' eyes for the big moments that matter. And so we've innovated a lot in our physical channels. We know that if we do direct marketing, as an example, even in digital to a Gen Zer, if we don't have a branch nearby, they're not responding. And so they don't want to go in the branch every day, but they want to know it's there for them to bank with you. And so what we've done is we've spread out. Uh, we, yep. Instead of just having all one size fits all branch formats, we've got eight or nine branch formats now. Hub and spoke, big ones with wealth managers and mortgage people, and then we've got mini ones with transaction centers. We've we've introduced um, 150 what we call ITMs, intelligent. Uh, deposit machines that actually have video tellering capability. We've got cashless branches where you can just go in for advice, go in to do some basic stuff. And it allows us to just keep spreading out to serve more communities uh, than we otherwise would have. Uh, and because the fact that there's a branch billboard there that shows the power of the brand and has somebody there for them to talk to is really important. So we're committed to retail banking, but it's going to be in a very, very different way, an innovative distribution mindset, different formats, more technology even embedded in the physical physical stores so our customers can come in and, and leverage the bank in a connected way. So, Brendan, you know, Gen Z is known for their commitment to social and environmental causes. It's important for banks many times to align in the same way that the consumer wants you to align. How do you monetize this commitment and how are you doing this as citizens? Yeah, I, I think at the end of the day, it comes down to a couple of pretty simple um, principles that I don't think are necessarily new. It's kind of just do the right thing. And, um, you yeah, that's what we're doing with our ESG agenda. I, I, I uh, agree with you that m more often than not, and certainly in an increasing way, the younger, dem younger demographic is picking a brand for more than just the products and services offered. It's based on the purpose they serve in the community. That can be defined quite broadly. ESG is part of it, obviously. What else do we do from a community service standpoint? Are we really committed to the areas where we work um, and support? And so we, we've got a whole program around that. It's kind of core to Citizens DNA. It always has been. As much as we've changed and transformed, the kind of community uh, has been a core tenant of our brand that's very authentic here. Uh, we've broken records every single year in terms of how we um, you know, volunteer in the communities. The ESG agenda uh, is very important to us as well. And so, you know, we've made um, a tremendous amount of progress uh, as an organization. We've rolled out some new products, particularly in the commercial banking side, green deposit offsets and wealth management. We've got ESG funds that allow you to invest in companies that are focused on, um, you know, cleaner energy. Uh, we've really, uh, at the end of the day, in our small business and commercial segment, part of our role as an advisor, if you view yourself as an advisor, not just a banker, is for us to help our companies become greener that we bank and position them for their business model to sustain the test of time. So as much as we want to position our own bank, it's incumbent on us as an advisor to help work our business clients through their own transformation. So their business, uh, they see the value in it and, and they can compete and win uh, in the same ways that we're looking at it here. Um, you know, we've also looked a lot at, um, in my business and consumer, uh, in mortgage. We've done a lot of things to modernize the programs that we offer to, to offer first-time buyer programs and benefits and discounts that uh, encourage cleaner energy and uh, upgrading homes. Our home equity line of credit business does a lot of the same to provide capital out there to reposition homes to be more uh, energy efficient and more green. And our, our auto loan business, which um, we actually just announced that we're going to shut down new originations, but we were on a, a bit of a journey to really lean in there and make sure that where we were putting capital out in the market, 
even though we're not manufacturing the cars, that it's oriented in a way that's really helping to put capital in places that's facilitating a greener agenda, whether it's EVs or otherwise. Uh, and so we've, we take it very, very seriously uh, at Citizens, and uh, not just because it's popular and it's in the mainstream media, but because it's the right thing to do. These are things, this is where our, our country's going, and uh, we want to make sure we're, we're, we're leaning in in a way that's productive and helpful uh, to our communities. You know, it's interesting. It's not a social agenda, but the whole concept of what you've done as far as overdrafts and not nickel and diming consumers, that in the mindset of a, a Gen Z is a good way to lose a business instantly. Because what happens is, you know, they've tried their best. And if you're not a partner with them, they, they're very quick to react. I mean, I, it, you know, it's really interesting how getting the Gen Z consumer is very hard losing them is very easy and and you know yep. we keep on we trip a lot you know it, as traditional financial institutions because we have legacy mindsets around what this consumer segment represents so when you look around you at other financial institutions without mentioning names you know what are the biggest mistakes or missed opportunities you've seen in the banking industry around reaching this demographic yeah it's there's a lot of short sightedness. And if you, if you just pull back and look at overdraft to your point, um, if you did a, bit, a business case on the benefits of having lower overdraft versus, um, uh, you know, the risks, it, it all pays for itself. It just takes a little bit of time and putting aside the right thing to do. Just, if you just were going to be relentless about financial impact, you know, it's a three year payback, uh, to say, we're going to take less fee income in the short term, but we're going to improve our customer acquisition. We're going to improve our retention, improve our deepening. Uh, all those are good things for the firm long term. And you just have to play the long game and uh, make sure you're building a business that's fit for purpose. And so uh, that's how we looked at you know, the overdraft uh, innovation that we we put in that, uh, and by the way, uh, you know, we're, we're, we, we've gone up 40 points in our net promoter score, and it's not just because of overdraft. It was a big piece of it, but our digital investments and otherwise, uh, it's, it's really paying a lot of dividends for the firm uh, long term to position to be a, a winner with the younger uh, demographic. So uh, these are things that um, are really important. And so, yeah, without mentioning firms, but I would say general statement is that when I see banks that aren't winning, it's because they've got this short sightedness is that they're managing their firm quarter to quarter. They're managing their firm uh, without all the tools in the tool shed. Uh, that's t typically the smaller banks. I, I actually have a lot of empathy for some of the smaller banks. You know, for, for me, if I look at the economics of retail banking, they're they're under siege. And you've got overdraft going down, you got to get through this change curve. Uh, you got to invest a ton in technology, invest more in brand. You got to try to pull away some costs in the branches and reposition your formats. There's a lot going on there. And in order for to make the economics go around in, in retail banking, you need to have deep relationships with clients. You have to have cross-sell into mortgage and cross-sell into wealth management and cross-sell into things like student loans and card. The smaller banks don't have all those products because those are scale products. And so uh, you, you see a lot of mid-sized, smaller regional banks kind of still holding on to overdraft because, um, you know, for me, I could, I could take it down closer to zero and I have to replace it with earning the revenue in more healthy and sustainable and durable ways in wealth management, mortgage, and credit card. If you don't have those products, you're taking down your revenue and and you, and you don't have anything to replace it with. And so uh, I do think this whole dynamic around overdraft in particular is going to be an accelerant around consolidation in banking and the breadth and capabilities that you need to win with a younger um, audience, whether it's technology investment, brand investment, or, bro or breadth of products and services all really matter. But anyway, that's, I would say that the mistakes I see, one is unavoidable, the structural mistake of being a small bank and not having the breadth to compete. And then uh, the attitudinal mistake of the bigger banks to be a little too slow moving, not invest in innovation, dismissive of the fintechs, uh, dismissive of uh, customer trends and and thinking that, you know, our industry is not going to be in this kind of two to three year decade transformational moment. I think, uh, you know, t they, they can kind of live through the next couple of years at their own peril if that's the mindset that they've got. You know, it, it's interesting. I'm almost seeing it. The worst scenario is a combo of both. A small financial institution that continues to look at banking the way we did back in the 70s and 50s and 60s. And it's really interesting because we're seeing some really innovative things being done by some small banks. But a complete, it takes a complete mind shift at the top of the organization to say, 
we are going to do what we do really well, but we're going to have to do it differently. We can't depend on we're the friendly bank or, or your neighborhood bank. You have to do more. You maybe have to look at banking as a service. You may look have to look at embedded banking solutions. I mean, we've seen some great stories, but you're right. It, it puts If you're looking simply at the numbers game, it puts small organizations at a disadvantage unless they think of banking completely differently. So when you look at Citizens Bank, you know, one of the things that financial institutions never did very well, but they they kind of put their toes in the water was around social media and influencer marketing. That's really important to the Gen Z consumer. How are you doing things different in citizens with regard to the way you look at social media and and influencer marketing in general? Yeah, it is really important. And I think there's a lot of mistakes that banks can make. And I, I put it all in the same uh, starting point, same category that uh, you know, we have a, a talent challenge in financial services that folks have been in our industry uh, haven't been uh, you know long long well known for being the most innovative. They're great at other things, but they haven't been the most innovative. And what uh, sort of the doctor called for here is innovation and disruption to our industry, and and that kind of flows through social media and how we think about marketing as well. And so. Uh, folks that don't have that innovative mindset. I've seen folks either just put their head in the sand like an ostrich. I've also seen folks say, well, let's do social media. And they just start doing posts on on Twitter and Facebook, but it's inauthentic and ineffective. And so at the end of the day, you have to acknowledge, I think, first that um, – you know, social media is good for a couple things. One is it has to be a listening post for your customers. So they want to engage with you there, even if it's a painful engagement. And you can't just have stock brand answers. You're going to have to resolve issues via social media, talk to engage customers one-to-one and have it feel like it's the same as them walking into a branch. We have to have that level of service standard through social because that's particularly the younger demographic demands it. When you turn your mindset to marketing and using social as a customer acquisition vehicle, um, you got to recognize one thing, which is they're coming to social usually for either entertainment or news. They're not coming to be solicited. And so for you to get their attention, you can't go out and social and think about marketing in the same way you do typical brand TV advertising on network television. You have to get be interruptive and get their attention and participate in the media that they're in for the reasons they're in. So that's where social media influencing becomes important. If they're there for entertainment, how are you partnering up with the right uh, people that are going to be introducing your brand in authentic ways that doesn't feel like a marketing push. The second it feels like a marketing push, the, the second it's ineffective. So we've done a lot of things like that. We've done um, you know various different creative strategies in TikTok to where we have various different influencers. We entered New York City. We bought two banks last year, HSBC's U.S. franchise and Investors Bank. It was a great opportunity for us to introduce a new brand. We've used Eli Manning uh, as a sponsor. He's been out in social media in a very authentic way, talking about citizens, but not in a marketing way. He's kind of showing, swiping his own card and, you know, just subtly getting our brand out there that people there, they trust, they see our card in their wallet. So there's lots of ways to do it, but uh, it starts with, I, I really do think from a marketing standpoint, a recognition that for you to participate while there. You can't have a traditional marketing mindset. You have to be in the conversation that they want to be in for it to be have any chance of being effective. Finally, Brendan, you know, at the very beginning of the podcast, I, I mentioned the fact that we're all talking about trying to reach out to Gen Z and Gen Y and the younger consumer overall. But it's really a big difference between talking about it and doing it. What advice would you give to financial institutions as to where to start. And it may not just be for Gen Z. It may be any segment that they're trying to reach. Where do they need to start? Yeah. You have to have a test and learn mindset. Every organization is going to be different. And um, the world is just so much more fragmented and it's moving so much faster. And so uh, ways that used to work for us 18 months ago to attract Gen Zers don't work anymore. And so you know, when I started in banking, uh, you know, our marketing playbook was, you know, pretty standard. And we did TV ads and we did advertisements in the newspaper. We changed our pricing and it made a different. That doesn't work anymore. That mindset, those tactics certainly don't work, but that mindset doesn't work anymore. And so 
uh, where I would I would suggest people start is less specific on the tactic and more attitudinally in your mindset about how you're running the bank, which is you've got to be agile, you've got to be fast moving, you have to have uh, performance management that's fast to understand so you can uh, cut bait quickly, be okay with failing and try something new, and also realize that you're not going to have any silver bullets. Uh, the market's so fragmented that one strategy is not going to have uh, you know, a dramatic effect to everything you're doing. You're going to have to have 30 things that work really well. Um, and, and that's what we work through. We're constantly cutting things out. This used to work. It doesn't work. Go away from it. Let's test a new thing. It worked okay. We're going to pivot and do something different. It's just very diversified. And so that's that's a culture that's un, that's not common in banks to have. We're risk organizations and we manage things slowly and methodically, but you got to have the ability to go fast and you have to marry that control with speed and innovation. And so that would, that's what I would say. But we're, you know, dig, digital is obviously a big thing, but it's not always just digital. Interacting and in, like, we're kind of back to some basics of guerrilla marketing. Got to be in the community. Go out where these folks are. They're not watching network TV. Uh, you know, go to, go to the concert venues, go to the new and interruptive ways where you can get your brand out in a way they've got just cognitive overload like we all, we've we've talked about whether we should even be doing email marketing anymore how many people actually read their marketing messages in email anymore you know what you it actually may be a reversion back to your mailbox because you used to be overwhelmed with your junk mail that's going away and now you're over, overwhelmed with your email mail so you know where are you going to find ways that you can actually stand out and you just have to have that test and learn mindset Brendan, thank you so much for being on the show today. We're going to have you back again because your organization truly has transformed itself through people and through leadership from a, uh, I'll say, a rather staid organization back in the day when I used to serve it uh, in the direct and database marketing area, but really it, it continually become dynamic. And you're right, it's test and learn, it's taking chances, but it also is a top-down mentality. So great to have you on the show. Thanks a lot, Jim. It was real, real fun. And uh, looking forward to being back soon. Thanks for listening to Banking Transform, the winner of three international awards for podcast excellence. We appreciate the support we've received since we made this endeavor a success over three years ago. If you enjoy what we're doing, please take some time to show some love in the form of review. Finally, be sure to catch my recent articles on the financial brand and check out the research we're doing for the Digital Banking Report. This has been a production of Evergreen Podcast. A special thank you to our senior producer, Leah Hassage, audio engineer, Chris Fafalias, and video producer, Will Pritz. I'm your host, Jim Roos. Remember, if you win Gen Z, you win the future. If you ignore Gen Z, they'll never forget.